Golf Club. I'm Mikey Burrows. Alongside me, as ever, is Chris Wellamo. And on this episode, we're joined by a man who made 183 appearances over six years, scoring 14 goals. Welcome to the old golf club, Simon Edward Osborne. Thank you very much for the middle name as well. Yeah, the full, you get, you get <laughs> the, the full, full treatment. Name. Love it. The full Thank name you. treatment whenever you come on this That's program. That's the king, by the way, Edward. Yeah. Know you. Well, for many people who watched during that period, you're the king of the midfield. I'm not so sure about that. They're Marmite, I think, I'm probably name myself. Well, as. I mean, we all are. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, very true, very true. I guess, I guess, lots of players probably think they were. Why do you think you were? No, just like I said, it's certain times. Like I said, I, I took a few risks, gave the ball away a few times. So some people would take to me, others wouldn't. And like I said, I, it's it's difficult, isn't it? You're ne- you're never going to be liked by everyone. I mean, because. It, when we were talking on our podcast, which people can download from all the usual places, there's lots of discussion about the type of midfielder you were. I was thinking about what makes a good midfield pairing because you were talking about you and Carl Robinson and the way that you would hold back to allow him to go forwards and do stuff. And I was thinking about Neves and Martinho now and maybe Inson Ray that kind of followed your time at the club and you had Carl Henry and Dave Jones looms. What what made you work? Because there was a lot of midfielders at the club when you first arrived. Yeah, there was an awful lot. I think it's just, you sort of get, sometimes it just hit off with someone. Like I said in the forward, you hit off with another player who understands and the ball's coming to you, where he's going to be to help you out. Again, sometimes picking up the spaces that you leave, like for myself, is picking up like a Carl Robinson. Um, and those little bits, you sort of gel. You know, I'd like to play sort of maybe for more forward passes where somebody else might be a ball winner. Um, so that's so the, the different dynamics between the two of you and then a lot of the times then it went into the midfield three so you know you'd have a Tony Dinny alongside you or someone like that um, but yeah when I first come to the club there were some fantastic players here you know Paul Short, um, Gordon Cowens was here when I first got here um, people like that and you're just watching these guys train and even even then me sort of coming up just been signed uh, for a bit of money and you're still watching these guys day in day out and you're thinking wow you know he's a, an international that's the level you've got to get to yeah you don't have to have a relationship off the pitch, though, do you? You know, like it's a lot of people put an importance on that. Now you talk about Carl Henry and David Jones; they they were joined at the hip, but I've also seen where they don't go on, but as soon as they cross the line, that just that just kind of clips into place. Oh, 100%. That understanding. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I said, you you don't have to. Like I said, you you have a friendship, you have an admiration, you have a a respect for somebody who's playing alongside you, and it's a mutual respect, hopefully. But you don't have to go out for dinner for them. You don't. You don't have to buy them birthday presents. One hundred percent. Plus, it saved you a few quid at Christmas. <laughs> um, so no, you don't have to have that. But again, it, and I think a lot of that comes from the respect. The respect from what you do during the week in training to also when it's not going so well. I think is the true mark of things is when it's not going well. Are you going to keep doing the same things, or are you going to be one of those guys that wants to hide and shy away? And I, I think probably some of the times when things weren't probably going as well for me on the pitch. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to go and hide. I'm going to keep trying to do it. And I might give the ball away a load more times, but I will keep doing it. We touched on it before, sorry, uh, with, with, with Mark McGee. So how did the whole Wolf thing come about and, and what was your, your thought process before you, you joined the club? Well, like I said, I was at, at Palace, went to Reading. had a really good season at Reading. Uh, really enjoyed my football under Mark McGee. It, it got to the end of the season. I'd had a bit of a dodgy knee injury, sort of uh, New Year's Eve and missed a couple of months of football. Came back, it wasn't quite right, but we was obviously going for the playoffs and so on and so forth. So I carried on playing. Then I had another up at the end of that season. Um, Mark McGee went to Leicester, showed a bit of interest. Ray Wilkins at QPR. So I then decided to stay in the Premier League, or well, get into the Premier League with Ray Wilkins, signed there. Signed in the July, didn't, didn't work out for whatever reason. Just one of those things, we didn't see eye to eye. I didn't play as much as I felt I did, and I just wanted to play football. It was just, I wanted to play every Saturday. I didn't want to sit on the bench. I didn't want to not be involved, um, especially after having the season before. And, it, you know, it was brilliant, highlighted at Wembley. And then, obviously, Mark moved here. Uh, my agent at the time sort of phoned up and said, look, Mark's gone to, to Wolves. Obviously, he wants to try and take you there. Would you be interested in talking to him? And I was like, desperately, yes, 100%. You know, I want to I want to play football. I don't yeah. care where it is. Yeah. I want to play in the first team. I want to go out every week. I want to play in front of the fans. I want to, that's my Saturday. Do you know, that's that's what you, you, you play football for. You want to play on, the, on a Saturday. You don't want to sit on the bench. And came up, met with Mark here, had a look round, stayed in, you know, even then, you're looking at it going, this is a, you know, this is a nice stadium, the, the training pitch was, yes, we trained, we got changed here and went down, but it was all set up and I was just like, yep, you know, I'm, I'm up for this. Grant Taylor's obviously left not long ago, you're sort of looking at it, this is a club that should, in that period of time, 
we should have got promoted. I don't care what you say. We <coughs> felt basically as, as, a, as a team, as a collective, we failed. We should have got promoted. But the players we had at a certain time were certainly good enough to get out of the, the, the championship. Well, and, um, and that's the, when I just signed there, Chris. I came up, talked to him, explained it. He said, I want you to do the same stuff he was doing before. Got faith in you. I've seen it at Reading. Will you sign? I just went, yeah, straight away. We'll get to some of those nearly moments. Oh, um, but just, I'm just fascinated because when you first arrived, and I know they weren't all there because some moved out, but you had Mark Atkins, Paul Birch, Steve Corricat, Gordon Cowens, Tony Daly, obviously a bit more wide, uh, Neil Emblem, Darren Ferguson, um, yourself, Mark Rankin, Carl Robinson was at the club but didn't really no, feature in that first that, season. Yeah. Uh, Vinny Samways had come in on loan, Jeff Thomas. That's an awful lot of central mm. midfielders. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot. Yeah, like I said, he was changing it as well, though, Mark. Gordon didn't really play a lot at the end of that season. He was sort of coming towards the end of his career. Um, and there was a few of the guys who were going out. Jeff was still unfortunately injured. Um, yeah, but I, I didn't see it that way. I didn't, I didn't look who was here. As a footballer, you don't look who's at a football club. I, I didn't. I didn't look at it and go, oh, there's lots of people there. I might not play. Yeah. I just looked at it and spoke to the manager, saw the place, felt that it was right for me at that particular time. I didn't care who was here. I, I, I trusted what I wanted to do. If, if I come to the football club and produce what I can pl produce, I play. So that, you know, If you don't play me and I'm doing well, then I'll be knocking on your I was just going to ask you that. So if you had looked at the, the players that were there, you would have made the same decision anyway because you've got that confidence in your own ability, what you're about. Same decision. Manager shows faith in you, wants to sign you for money. And like I said, if I can produce what he wants me to produce, then I, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, I should get in the team. There's times when, as you well know, Chris, where you feel you're doing well and you're not in the team, and you're asking, and you will be asking the questions, why not? Why not? And it might be, oh, we're winning. Okay, I can suffer that. Well, we didn't win. And then the moment that we didn't win, yeah, another knock on the door. We didn't win. Why am I not in? And, and but you're trusting yourself, and that's when you know you have to train well. You have to try and look after yourself, do the best as you can, be upbeat. I'm, I'm one of them people. Fortunately. Not a joker, but I like to go in. I enjoyed training. I'd moan, don't get me wrong, yeah. you know. Cones come out for running, it's the old running of athletics club and all the, <laughs> the usual rubbish that always goes on that someone always says, but I always enjoy training, I love training. And um and it, it was one of the things, you know, like call me a chirpy cockney, I'm not a cockney, but I'd always be a little bit upbeat and try and try and come in and, and enjoy training and get something out of it. And then, but when it starts getting when you're not playing a lot of time, it you start getting a little bit despondent with it. Again, injuries are a big part of that as well. But yeah, I just I would have made exactly the same choice. Never changed it one little bit. Never regretted it at all. So is there a part of you that quite enjoyed competition? Yeah, I think you have to. I think it's for what you know myself and Chris have done as a as a profession, you have to enjoy the competition because if you don't, it, it can it can send people under. I've seen some really good footballers that couldn't handle the Saturday. Fantastic trainers, yeah. You know, and it, but come the Saturday with that little bit of added pressure, that little bit more in it. Would it be competition playing against somebody else from another team when he's playing against his teammates that he's friends with? Come to Saturday, just couldn't produce that same form that you'd seen from Monday to Friday. Just couldn't do it. And that's, again, is it pressure? Is it a bit of competition because the other guy's now up against him? There's not quite a competition in training. It, it was intense, but it's never quite the same as what you're playing in a match. So that's, you know, you have to have that little bit in there. Would you say that frustration, like you never really kind of got got to show that in, in, in the Premier League with Wolves and not really get there. Was that a, a low point? Yeah, I think it was. I think because of the players, when you look at when you look back, I think when you, you in hindsight, it's a great thing as we know, when you look back at what we had at the time, you had everything really that we should have been pushing for automatic promotion, mm -hmm. not sneaking into the playoffs and then just falling out of it, you know. Yeah. Steve, as you've talked about, Steve Ball, Don Goodman, John DeWolf was here at a certain time. The players, you, you, you can drag out your stats on there. The players we had here, we should have been better than we were. And we, we got close a couple of times, but never quite got over the line. And it wasn't for the want to try, and it wasn't for, for anything. It was just certain moments, key moments in key seasons, we let ourselves down, and it, that, that just knocks the whole thing out of it. You know, Being in the playoffs and drawing at Grimsby, say, nil-nil, I think it was. You're not then back in it. You get out of it. You can't get back in it. There's, and that's probably the one regret because I felt at the time, as a team on our day and at certain things, which was highlighted by certain cup runs, we should have been better than we were, hundred percent. You know, I picked up a few injuries while I was here, which didn't help. But I still think the squad we had was ample to get us into yeah. that in that Premiership. And to be fair to Dave Jones, like I said, I, I left when Dave came in. Um, I was captain and left. It's just one of those things he wanted to change. And to be fair to him, he bought. You know, a bit of a new broom in, and within a couple of years, the guys have got promoted. You know, brought in Alex Ray, Colin Cameron, people like that, and that's what managers get live and die for. I had, you know, my time at Wolves probably was was done. Much as I hated it, 
Um, it was probably at that time where someone's going to come in and go, actually, now we haven't done it. You know, and that's why managers get paid big bucks. We haven't done it. Why haven't we done it? Okay. Yeah. Move on. You're so philosophical about this, though. Because <laughs> you... at the time it's not. It's at the time it's not. Don't get me wrong. At the time it's you know deadline day. I'm left and, and I left here and went to Tranmere. At the time it, it like really I, I didn't really play under him. We had a couple of ding dongs, but that's just how it is. That's just football. And he, but then when you look at it, and then when I came back and in the summer, and, it, and he allowed me to just come in and do a bit of training, a bit and pieces to keep myself ticking over. I had no problems with it. It's done. You know, you have to look at it that way. You can't if you live your life regretting everything you've done in your life. You'll never sleep. But this is the thing that, like, because when we first started the podcast, you joked about the Reading playoff final. That, like, because people might forget this that only like one team went up automatically that year. So yeah. you actually finished second. Yeah. You then part of like an epic playoff final because they were all pretty much mm. epic in that period in the nineties and stuff. Um, and then you kind of get a little short spell at the Premier League, and then you come back to Wolves, and then you're like losing the playoffs to your old team. <laughs> you then yeah, I'm, the, I'm actually not going to go home tonight, am I? <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing, and then no, you know you're seventh co yeah. consistently up there. You had the FA Cup semi final that you end up not being able to play in, and it, like, if that was me, I don't know whether I'd be chirpy. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it must there's be so lot, frustrating. Listen, there's lots of you know I've had serious knee operations. Like Chris will tell you, we've had injuries. I, I play. It's not something you don't expect to get patted on the back for it. But I played the season we got beat by Palace. I played from March through to the end of the season. I barely trained. You know, he'll tell you yeah. you've had knee problems. Yeah. I had, a, I had a, my knee was playing me up basically from what I'd had previously, and so I'd literally play on a Saturday. We'd come in on a Monday. The doctor would drain my knee. I sit down. I'm not trained. I'd go on the bike. I might jog around on a Thursday, do a little bit on a Friday, play Saturday. If there was a Tuesday game, I didn't do any training. You'd play Saturday, Tuesday. And it's like I said, you know, I'm not expecting, I don't want to pat on the back for it. I'm not, what, you want to play. You want to get promoted. You know, I'm not asking for a medal. You just do it because you want to play, you want to get promoted. And then sometimes you look at little bits and go, well, actually, I played football. You know, I played 500 games or whatever it is. Yeah. Why, why am I going to be bitter about it? Why am I going to be not, you know what I mean? Why am I not going to be happy about it? I get people can be bitter now, the money, the this, the that, the fame. It's great. Don't get me wrong. We'd all love it. I'd love to not be working. Trust me, I'd love to not be working. <laughs> But I had some great times, and I wouldn't change them for one thing. See, that's it, it's, and it is. It's what you just said there in hindsight. You know, what if, what if my knees were, were fine? Because I think I got one day, one day a season that, and it was the first day of pre season that you never had a niggle, that you never had swelling there if it wasn't. And just what you're saying, I, I couldn't walk. There's, 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 you'd go from day to day where you couldn't actually even, you, it wasn't possible for you to train. Then all of a sudden you'd pop your pill, you'd have your injection, and you'd go out and play. And then you knew the next four days were a write off. And it's just part, but again, you do it because you go out and play. Sometimes you'd be excellent, sometimes you'd be. Yeah, not yeah, very good. Not very good. But that's not an excuse, was it? No, not at all. You, you, didn't, didn't, yeah. you didn't make the injury. The injury wasn't the Never excuse. Never an excuse. Yeah. It wasn't an excuse. It was just part of what you had to manage exactly. at that particular time. And then, like I said, I went. That was probably. That was probably my lowest point at Wolves was that. Not that I lost playoffs, I was gutted about that stuff. The worst point was I had that knee injury, got all the way to the end of the season and it wasn't anybody's fault. You go and see the, this guy and that guy and you see all these, do that. And I literally went all through the summer doing this rigorous programme. It'll be fine. You haven't you do this, do this, do this. So literally every day, gym, strengthening this, this, build it up, build it up, build it up. Come all the way back to pre-season, start the running thinking, oh, this, you know, this feels all right. Don't feel too bad, do the running. The moment we got into the ball work a little bit more and then it started getting more intense, I, I literally come off the pitch down at Compton here crying. <laughs> literally. I was like, oh, not not crying, frustration. Oh, my knee's killing me. Like, Gaff, what's the matter? I said, my knee's killing me. I can't kick the ball. It's my left knee, so I was placing it. I go, I can't kick the yeah. ball. And he went, but we, I said, I've done all this stuff, honestly. I said, I cannot kick the ball. I can still feel it now. I can still, honestly, I get emotional thinking about it now. Yeah. It hurt me that much yeah. that I couldn't play. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? Yeah. So, because this is then the, the kind of the almost unanswerable question, probably. If you had people like you who were prepared to do that and put yourself through that personal pain to play, you had, the, as you said before, the components of players in the squad, in and around mm. it. You know, it, it, later on in the period, you had the likes of Robbie Keane and people coming through, and you had Steve yeah, yeah, Fogger yeah. before that, and real talented players around. Oh, yeah. Why did it never work then? 
honestly, I've been asked that so many times. I can't, I honestly cannot put my finger on any particular reason. We trained well. Yeah, we liked a night out. I think everybody at that particular time did. We worked hard. We, you know, we worked on the shape. We watched the other teams. We did all the stuff that we're supposed to. Honestly, if I could answer that question, I'd be Pep. Yeah. I would be Pep. Because I've n we have no idea. We Like you said, we had all the components. We had all the pla We did the right, you know, the team were good. You know, we were not just a team. We were not, not, not everybody was friends, but we had a good team spirit at that particular time. But we just couldn't, we couldn't go that final bit, that final hurdle. Just couldn't get over it, whatever it was. The, the playoffs, losing to Palace, the getting into the playoffs, then just dropping back out of it. I honestly can't tell you what that was. Was the expectation too high? No, I don't think so because you placed it on yourself. You place yeah. it on yourself with what you got. You, you know, you look around you. You know, if I'm in the dressing room and I'm looking at Chris and Carl Henry and this and that, I'm going to be going in the championship going, really? We need to be on the top half. We don't need to be 11th, you know, with what you're sitting within in and around you. You'll be looking at your guys around you and we're going, you'd have the conversations. We'd have to, you know, you'd have the, what are we doing? What are we not doing? You'd sit there, wouldn't we? Go out for a couple of beers or whatever and we'd have a little heart to heart and go, you know, what are we doing? What, what's happening? Not just the management, that was players. That's the players, yeah. 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 And you'd have that, you know, and you might have to have one or two, you're not pulling your weight and whatever, you know, and, that would happen. Be done. Be dusted. Back in. Get on with it again. Maybe not expectation from you guys then, but externally. Because listen, I've spoken to a lot of ex-players mm. doing this and doing other things, and that place out there, when it's going right oh, and yeah. it's rocking, it's amazing. There are a lot of players that will say when it's not going right, it's one of the worst yeah. places. It's, to play. it's harsh. It can be really harsh, and that's why I think maybe that was some of it is that people couldn't. If it wasn't quite going as well as it was, maybe some of those guys would not hide, but not be able to take it. Instead of trying to go, right, let's just keep doing the stuff that we know will get us get us somewhere, try and change a little bit of something, maybe not quite go that extra 5%, and maybe that expectation, because you're in a quite a bubble here. You know, a lot of us at the time lived in and around the area, so there are people constantly, you are you know, Saturday night, you might be sitting down in yeah. a meal, you've lost, you're only having a meal, you're not having a drink. Oh, you lot are rubbish today, this, that, the other. Maybe that had an effect on it. Yeah, but with that group of players, players couldn't hide. They weren't allowed to hide because it'd be called out. Yeah, You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? And that sort of... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it wouldn't be... But you know, Chris, as well as anything, if you're not quite 100% at certain you times, it, you, you, you can get you can get past. You can get through a game sometimes. and Not coast, but do enough to get through it. And then somebody go, seven, six. Yeah. It's all right. It's not an eight. But if you're a six and a seven, James Milner, you know, James Milner, seven, 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 eight, nine. Seven, seven, seven. That's why the guy plays so many games. Yep. He is Mr. Dependable. And if you've got those guys that do that, you've got half a chance. And like I said to you, we, we've analysed it. You look at it back, you go for the players, how did we not do that? We was in pole position and then we blew out. We had a shocking week where we drew two games and lost one. You know, yep. one week of just too many players at particular times not playing well. So if you've got five or six in the team that's having a shocker, you're in trouble. You've got two, you can carry a couple, but you can't carry four or five. And that's, but I think at the time we just didn't, we just couldn't get it. We just couldn't finish that that last little bit off. The club wasn't hugely stable off the field either for a lot of that period, was it? Not particularly, but it wasn't anything that that didn't bother you. You know, we we'd get changed here, we'd go down to the training ground, we'd train, we'd come back. Uh, your weights and stuff was down here. It's all different now, and there was a bit of in, in instability upstairs and whatever else. But I don't think players of us at that time didn't really take any notice of it. If I'm honest with you, I. It wouldn't bother me one little bit. I didn't look at it and go, oh, what's going on up there? All I'd worry about is going into training, training or not training and playing. And that, that stuff, I think that's a, that's a red herring for me, 100% a yeah. red herring. See, the, with the regime then, what was the difference like, with Mark McGee and Colin Lee? What was what was different in, in the whole outlook, coming into training every day, them, man management? What was Mark was the more man, in, man manager. Mark was the sort of little bit more upbeat, Aberdeen, joining a little bit here and there. Um, he was a bit more like that. Knew his football, obviously had that. Colin was the sort of more the tactician. He was the one that would set the sessions, set the, the shape and the style. He'd take that sort of bit of it where Mark would be the sort of man manager one. And then those two worked really well. Yeah. And I think they had a bit of a falling out here. And then obviously Mark went and Colin took over. Um, and again, I, we can talk about a lot of things. And I think with a manager and a number two, there, there needs to be, like we talk about midfield players and centre forwards, there needs to be that, that little gel between those two guys as well. You need to have him and him because sometimes he's the bad guy and sometimes he's the bad guy and you can't both be bad guys or, or both be funny and, and I think that also adds to it I think Colin at the time was fine we had John Ward come in and they were both good don't get me wrong both great guys both good guys but sometimes I think they're a little bit too similar 
I think sometimes you need that little bit of change. Yep. And um, like I said, I, I always got on well with them. You know, I had the same thing. I'd stand up rows with Colin Lee. So it's the same, same as you do with any manager. You, you feel you should be playing. And you've got a manager at the time saying to you, oh, I didn't think you'd get back for your knee. And I'm like, oh, cheers. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for that, Gaff. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm glad you're happy. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, you know, you battle through and then you're sort of sitting there going, what do I, what do I need to do to get any football into your team? Well, well, you tell me then. That was always the best one. Steve Koppel told me that years and years back. Because I went in, I used to go and see Steve Koppel when I was at Palace and I was, you know, 17, just going to ask him things and obviously Man United and whatever. And he was only a young manager at the time. And I remember going in to ask him something and he just used to start talking and I'd come out and go, I didn't even ask him. He'd just baffle me straight away. He'd start talking to him. He'd start asking me questions straight away. So by the time I tried to ask him, like, Gaff, what do I need to get in your team? I'd already walked out the door. I'd go out the door and go, I can't knock on it now, can I? I've got to go. <laughs> yeah. I've not asked him, why. <laughs> yeah. how do I get in your team? He's just baffled me a few questions. I've answered a few back. And now I've gone, oh, cheers, Gaffer. I've walked out. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> Brilliant. Could you have that same relationship with Mark McGee or Colin Lee? Uh, Colin yeah, Lee doesn't strike me as that kind of guy. Little bits. You'd, you'd still go in. It's like any, it doesn't matter whatever manager you have. Like I said, you know, <coughs> I've got respect for every single manager I've worked under. Don't see eye to eye with all of them. No. Had fallouts with every single one of them, from Steve Coppel right the way through to, to... I didn't have one with Graham Turner, I weren't there long enough, but down at Hereford. But all the way through till I finished with Merce. You have disagreements. But so long as they're healthy and it's it, you feel that you... You know, sometimes you sit there and you stew and stew and stew and think, I need to go and see him Nick. You'd stew, and then in the end, he goes, you know what, I'm going to go and see him. And you'd see him, and you'd come out and go, actually, I should have done that last week. Didn't play last week, why don't I go and see him? You try and train. So you, you have it with all of them. You have it with all of them. But you've got to respect, because you've got to remember, they're, and it's difficult when you're playing, when you stop or when you manage, you then realise how much other stuff comes into it. Yeah. You're not just, you know, we've managed ourselves, basically, as footballers. You manage yourself. Make sure you're getting on time. Make sure you do your training. Make sure you get this, that, the other. When you're a manager, you're managing everybody and his emotions and your emotions. And I'm emotional. And she's had a baby and he's done something else. It's all different. And he's crashed his car and he can't get a nice haircut because the geezer's done it wrong. And he's just lost his cat. There's a million different things that come into that. Do you know what I mean? And you've got to manage all of that stuff. And then you've got your session all set out and you've got a lovely session plan. Like I said, I can remember doing it at Wall Street. You've got your session sorted out. We've got all these. You're walking in the morning, you go, all right. Fizzo goes, no, easy, oh, easy, oh, easy. And you go, I'll throw your session plan in the bin. Because yeah. you've got 10 players. And you go, all right, might as well have a game then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was it awkward when Mark McGee left and Colin Lee became manager? Because I guess if you were, if one is gaffer and one is the assistant and then suddenly he's now gaffer. Mm. That's always difficult. It's always difficult when someone within, within the so-called group, because they move from Reading to, to Leicester together, as a three, there was him, uh, Colin and Mick Hickman. So they went from Reading to Leicester, then from Leicester as a group to Wolves. So when one stays, it's always a little bit tricky. It's always a bit prickly on the initial part of it. Yeah. Because no one's, you know, we all talk, we have gossip, don't we? It's just the nature of a beast. Yeah, he don't, they've had a fallout. You know, we make something up. I don't know, he nicked his car or whatever it is. Yeah. And um, it was a little bit, and it was a little bit. And like I said, that's where it becomes a little bit difficult because then Colin becomes the manager. <coughs> more than the coach or the assistant, whatever you want to call it. And then it's he's calling the shots effectively, where previously it's Mark maybe naming the team and now it's Colin. So it becomes a little bit different. A little bit a little bit strange at first to understand of what's what and then the new coach comes in or whoever he brings in there and it's like... Because mm. if Colin Lee was the tactician, did the tactics change after he left? Um, personnel, probably. He, he, he brought people in that probably he felt... What happens then is he he's... You sit and talk, me and Chris, oh, you should play you, or oh, yeah. no, no, he's done really well in training this week. No, I think he should play. He's not let us down last week, or whatever it is. So he'll have, not favourites, it's not favourites, it's just people that they feel will benefit the team more. So I might benefit him, and Chris might not. That's yeah. Colin's opinion to his opinion. So when he comes in, it tends to be more of a little personnel change, more than a massive tactic change, or we're going from four four two to three five two. It just tends to be, I actually like him better there, or I like him better there, and that's how it sort of changes around a little bit. Yeah, he's like, like one of them. He's he's the one that's he's making the decision, isn't he? That's the the management role. I think he can give his opinion. We we Mark McGee and but all fell on Mark then, wasn't it? So yeah. it's then. So when like so when Colin then gets into it, is it like a clean slate for everyone to show again? But because he's been in the building already, so it's not really that lift from the the group that you would usually get then, is it? No, it's not. Hundred percent, you're dead right. It's not the same because 
Colin might not like someone, so he, the, that person, player, be it me, knows exactly. Always has a preconceived idea course. already of what Colin does or doesn't like about him. Yeah. When a new manager comes in, as you well know, it's clean slate. Unless somebody's told him that you're a bad egg or whatever it is from somebody else, and that will happen. But yeah. Typically, he already knows the group, like you say. He already knows the group. He always knows the personalities, the this, that, the other. And sometimes it's it's almost the icing on the cake for somebody who hasn't been playing under Colin or Mark for him to just be, that's your final now. And then sometimes you've got to realise that and go, actually, I might as well get out of the door here. Yeah. Because I'm not going to play. When Mark went, did it, was it the right time? Should he have had longer? I don't know. It's funny, isn't it? It's a results-driven business. And at the time, it wasn't, we weren't playing brilliantly. We weren't getting great results. We weren't terrible. That's what um, I was going to say. It wasn't like you were miles off it. No, we weren't. We weren't. But it's just, and sometimes people, whether some other stuff had gone on behind the scenes, I couldn't answer that. But at the time, you're thinking, maybe, maybe not. But then you're looking at it and going, well, these guys want to get promotion. We feel we should have the squad to get promotion. And in the end, someone makes that decision. And again, it's, it's strange at the time because then, you, like you said, you're thinking, well, they're a collective. They've not gone as a collective. Is there something else that we don't ever know about? Yeah. Unless we got Mark McGee around the neck and asked him, we, we probably won't know that. Got be, sorry, the same, same question for, for Colin Lee then. You know, when David Jones come in, what was, uh, how did you feel about that? Was that? It was a strange one for me. For, for Like I said, I played and obviously Dave came in. Um, I broke my toe somewhere, I think Wickham away, I think I might have broke my toe and I was struggling to get back in and then came back and felt I was doing okay training wise. Um, but I think he'd, he'd, he'd set himself for going, right, well, I'm not going to play. You know, I'd been here six years. Obviously, yeah. I was club captain at the time. Whatever yeah. he thought, right. Time for time for that. So we had a couple of run-ins um, leading up to it. You know, just the usual sort of stuff. I want to play. He doesn't want to play me. I'm not getting involved. Whatever it is. So in the end, I just uh, made the decision at the time. They were trying to ask, wanted me to go to Tranmere. Tranmere were bottom of the league at the time, at, at, as it was. I dug my heels in a little bit, um, as you do. Sort of said, you know, I've done six years here. A bit of loyalty. He'd let me make make the decision, not forcing me out. I'm not going yeah, anywhere. Yeah, of course, yeah. I'm not going anywhere yeah. unless I want to. You know, my family's here. I don't have to. My contract was running out, um, and he was going to make a, a clean sweep. So I had no problem with that. And then once he'd made the decision and it was done, I went up to Tranmere and played the last sort of ten games up there at, at Tranmere to the end of the season. Obviously, they got relegated. Um, and like I said, after that, whenever I spoke to Dave Jones after that, it was absolutely fine. Like it's gone, done. He made his decision two years two years later, promotion. So it's it's fully justified of what he was doing at that particular time, and that's what. He got paid for. Yeah. Um, and then I sort of cut, went to tram in. Uh, we'll cut a long story short. I ended up not with a football club uh, the following season. So I'd gone from Wolves here, championship club captain, um, got messed about with an agent, long story, and ended up the following pre season with no football club. I eventually signed at Port Vale, Brian Hall, and I was driving to somewhere to play mm -hmm. with a couple of people. And I was driving up the motorway to go to Halifax, I think. It was Tony <coughs> Parks was at Halifax at the time. And I was just like, I need to get a club. This is ridiculous. I'm 30. And I got messed around, long story, didn't get this, didn't get that. Some agent was promising this. I was trying to offer the contract to turn it down, wanted to stay in the championship, so on and so forth. And then I came in, Dave was kind enough to let me train a couple of days and bits and pieces and see the fizz and, and get some rehab stuff, not rehab stuff, but just keep ticking over in the gym and that. So it was absolutely perfect. Anytime you want to come down, I was here, you can come down. Perfect. Brilliant. Yeah, and then literally drove up the road, was going up there. Up to Halifax, got a phone call from Bobby Barry, he's a friend of mine who runs an agency now and his mate, and he said, listen, I've just been on the phone to Brian Alton at Port Vale, will you go in there? I said, yeah, I'll go in. I said, going for a trial? I went, yeah, no problem, of course I will. I trust myself, I'll go in. Literally turned the car around at Nutsford, drove back down, went into Port Vale, went in, obviously met Brian Alton, sort of dragged me in the office, he said, so what's the story? I went, what do you mean? What's the story? Why haven't you got a football club? I went, oh, cause I'm not going to bore you with the details. So honestly, I said, I, I, I said, let me train and we'll talk afterwards. And he went, all right, fair enough. So he sent me out to training. I think it was a reserve team in training. Went out, trained, did what I do, was fit, kept myself in decent shape, trained, played. So literally, session finished, he went, get in my office in a minute. So just literally, I went, all right, I'll come see you in a minute. So anyway, got changed, walked back down, walked in the office. So he went, so you're going to tell me a story now? I said, I haven't got a story. I said, I'm not a bad egg, I've not done this. I said, speak to Dave Jones. I said, I fell out with him, but... He says, why not got a football club? I said, oh, agents, I'm not even going to talk to you about it. So he went, okay. He said, uh, will you sign? I went, yeah, whatever. He said, what do you want? I went, do it, you I don't care. So just want to play football. He went, all right, I'll be that in a minute. So he went upstairs, come down. He went, look, I'll give you a month of contract. I went, fine. So I signed it there and then played six games and then went to Julian. That was it. Just literally done it like that. He went, will you sign? I went, yeah, of course. Just signed it. Just wanted to play football. 
<coughs> just got know. back in. He, he literally went, you're not playing in reserves. So he literally pulled me off the pitch. He went, you're not playing in reserves. I said, no chance. He said, you're in the squad Saturday. Literally just pulled it out and played Saturday. Um, <laughs> we're just going to finish our um, main part of the show on kind of an element of attempting to rewrite history, which is, cool. this is a, a big part of kind of what we always talk about. So if I said to you, that in 1997 you get past Palace and you win that playoff final <clears> and the team gets promoted <coughs> and Sir Jack says, I'm going to pump some money in. What would have happened to this football club? Um, probably would have yo-yoed, if I'm honest with you, for a couple of years. I don't think the infrastructure in that was set to, to, to stay or sustain Premier League status, personally. That's just my personal opinion. We, we didn't really have a training ground. We didn't really have a facility that was going to take you to the next level. It, that was starting to come in. There were clubs that had it. We were a little bit probably behind <coughs> the times on that. So I would say we we're probably one of those teams that would yo you up and down, personally. You could throw all the money in the world here. But, you know, I'm obviously in construction now, but if I build on sand, the thing will subside yeah. eventually, you know. And I think that would probably what would have happened at that particular time. You know, you look at what, what's now. This has taken the step up to the Premier League, the step back down, all the heartache that's happened to then go, actually, you know, we need a solid academy, we need a training ground, we need this, we need that. So you put the building blocks in place yeah. and then eventually it all falls into place, doesn't it? Everything, all the other jigsaw pieces then all to come together. You've got the right players at the right time with the manager that's come in with a different ethos and all of a sudden it goes back up again. You know, this Wolves fans out there about Sol Rackens and people like that, they drive them mad. But at that particular time, and now you look at it now, the base is set, You've got a man that's got a philosophy and a way of playing. You've got the players that are bought into that ethos. And you've got, you know, you, you look at what you've got. And that's what you get. It's brilliant to have you in. Thank you for coming up. No problem. Making a special journey <laughs> to come and see us. There is plenty more that we've talked to Simon Osborne about. And we'll talk more as well on our extended podcast available from all the usual places. Thank you very much for watching.